Children's Church. I hope everyone's hearts are prepared for worship tonight. I wanted to read Psalm 100 for you all. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with jubilation. Come before him with rejoicing. Know that the Lord himself is God, and he is who has made us. And not we ourselves, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courtyards with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness is to all generations. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we just lift up our hands to you and our hearts to you. And we ask that you would be with us today and that we would honor you with our lips and honor you with our words and our heart and our actions. We give it all to you, Lord God, and we just ask that you would be praised and glorified in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And four years ago today, a major step was taken in the reforming of the church, bringing us out of darkness. Thank you, Lord. Have you ever been in a completely dark room and somebody turns on all the lights? It can be blinding. So the Lord, in His grace, did a gradual thing. And of course, those that were resisting it helped them out. So many of the reformers still. I see them as merry worshipers. Check it out if you don't think it's true. But the, the light of the truth of the gospel began to dawn. And the Reformation continued, and in a way, it's continuing even today. The first of the 95 theses that Martin Luther nailed on the church door there in Wittenberg says this, When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, Repent, Matthew 4, 17, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen? amen. Repentance isn't wallowing in your sins, but it's changing your way of thinking, changing your direction, receiving forgiveness, and moving forward by His grace. Can I get another amen?
text is dramatized by the New Media Bible, and in their historical research, they discovered that Egyptian men didn't like to wear shirts, so they wanted to be authentic. So brace yourselves, you may want to leave the room if that could be a problem. And Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen, and they had possessions therein, and grew and multiplied exceedingly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years, so the whole age of Jacob was 147 years. And the time drew nigh that Israel must die. And he called his son Joseph. And said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and deal kindly and truly with me. Bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt. But I will lie with my fathers, and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. And he said, I will do as thou hast said. And he said, Swear unto me. And he sware unto him. And Israel bowed himself upon the bed's head. And it came to pass after these things that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh, and Ephraim. And one told Jacob and said, Behold, thy son Joseph cometh unto thee. And Israel strengthened himself and sat upon the bed. And Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty appeared unto me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said unto me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful and multiply thee. And I will make of thee a multitude of people and will give this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. And now thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt before I came unto thee into Egypt, are mine. As Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. And thy issue which thou begettest after them shall be thine, and shall be called after the name of their brethren in their inheritance. And Israel beheld Joseph's sons and said, Who are these? And Joseph said unto his father, They are my sons whom God hath given me in this place. And he said, Bring them, I pray thee, unto me, and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim for age, so that he could not see. And he brought them near unto him, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said unto Joseph, I had not thought to see thy face. And lo, God hath showed me also thy seed. And Joseph brought them out from between his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near unto him. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. 
and let my name be named on them and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him, and he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. And Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die, but God shall be with you and bring you again unto the land of your father. like to speak to you today on the power of blessing children. In today's story, Israel is dying. He's been in Egypt for 17 years. Uh, interesting parallel, Joseph was 17 when his brothers kidnapped him and sold him into slavery. And here he's restored fellowship with his son 17 years, his favorite missing son. Now he's an old man, he's 147 and he's ready to bless his children. And we'll see in the next chapter next Sunday, he blesses all his kids, some of them not so much. But who knows, when you're told the truth, that's a blessing, right? As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Let him rebuke me and it shall be a favor, I believe is one of the messages in the scriptures. And so Joseph comes to him with his two sons. While freed from prison and made prime minister of Egypt, he was blessed with the daughter of a priest who blessed him with two sons. The first son he named Manasseh, which means forget, because God has made me to forget my sorrows. And the second son came along, he named him Ephraim, which means fruitful. God has made me fruitful in this land. And so now these young men are grown men now. They're not little boys. They have lives of their own. Maybe they have children of their own. And Jacob's going to bless them. But before he blesses them, he blesses Joseph by reminding him of what the Lord told him in Luz or Bethel on his way back in Genesis 35, on his way back from Laban, to meet his brother Esau. And the Lord appeared to him at Bethel and told him, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you. This is in verse 4. I will make of you a multitude of people and give this land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. So these blessings that Abraham passes down to Isaac, that Isaac passes down to Jacob, that Jacob passes down to his sons, did not originate with them but originate with Almighty God who revealed himself to those three patriarchs of the faith. And then he says, And now your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born to you in the land of Egypt, I guess you could say they were Egyptians, before I came to you in Egypt, are mine. As Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. So he's adopting them as his own. Who's heard of the 12 tribes of Israel? Well, but what happens here today literally makes them 13 tribes of Israel. 12 tribes inherited specific locations in the land, but the 13th tribe that didn't was Levi. The Lord was to be their inheritance, and their lives were devoted to their ministry. And so there is no technically no tribe of Joseph, but there's a tribe of Ephraim and Manasseh because of what the Lord did through Jacob here this day. 
and he told Joseph to bring your sons to me. Now, it's, it's kind of a formal setting. Joseph approaches him after hearing his father bless him, approaches him with his two boys, and he says, who are these? He knew who they were. To me, it's like a wedding. The, the, the minister says, who gives this woman to be wed? And if he's smart, the father doesn't say, I do. We know who gives a woman to be wed, but we say it in formality, right? To make it official. Uh, so here, this official, I, I see it kind of as an adoption ceremony, is uh, done by Joseph identifying his two sons. In the Roman Catholic Church, before they baptize a child, the priest will ask, who is this child? Now, he knows but it's part of their ceremony. You with me? So he says, they are my two sons whom God has given me in this place. And Jacob says, please bring them to me and I will bless them. So Joseph approaches him and imagine uh, Jacob sitting down. And here comes the oldest boy on his right and the youngest boy on his left. And Jacob does a switch. He crosses his hands and pronounces a blessing like this. Now, J- Joseph tried to correct him. No, Dad, because you know Dad was blind. <laughs> no, Dad, he, you're mistaken. He says, no, I know what I'm doing. He was led by the Lord. Uh, it's a biblical principle. It's reiterated again and again in the Scripture that God often prefers the younger over the elder. The first child born was Cain. Second child was Abel. It's not the only reason why he accepted Abel's sacrifice, but it illustrates the fact. Jacob was a younger of twins, Jacob and Esau. Jesus is the second Adam or the last Adam. The first Adam messed up. Jesus is the last Adam. And so here in Joseph's family, the younger is going to be placed above the older. He's going to be more prosperous. He's going to be more blessed. And when he questions his dad, he says, I know Manasseh shall also be a people. He should be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he and his descendants shall become a multitude of of nations. Now, before Moses died, he pronounced a blessing on the children of Israel. Don't turn there now, but it's a fascinating passage in Deuteronomy 33. And in that blessing, he pronounces blessing on Joseph tribe. And in that blessing, he says, Ephraim has his ten thousands, and Manasseh has his thousands. Israel's first king, Saul, was displaced by a second one, David, the man after God's own heart. You may have been born first or last in your family, but you were born maybe as Billy Bob, king of the south, or Susie Q, queen of the north. But God rejects your first birth and calls you to be born again. Yeah. If you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. So in this blessing, we see the seed of what would happen historically. When Solomon died, he was king of of the land of Israel. His son took the throne, and the people approached him saying, hey, could you go easy on us? Your dad was really tough on us, taxed us and really hard and He turned a cold shoulder to him. He says, listen, my dad's waist is like my little finger. In other words, you just think times are hard. Wait till I get to move in here. And so the kingdom split. A servant took the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom became known as Judea after the tribe of Judah. And in that kingdom were the Levites and the tribe of Benjamin. The other tribes were in the north. They became known as Israel or Ephraim. 
in, in the prophets, you'll see sometimes prophecies about Ephraim. And it's not geared just towards the tribe of Ephraim, but it's geared towards the northern tribes who became known by Ephraim. He was a blessed man. Can I get an amen? amen. So when God blesses you, it's a responsibility to take. Ephraim wasn't perfect, just like none of the patriarchs were perfect. But in their imperfection, God's will is done. Can I get another amen? amen? He said this in verse 15 in his blessing of these two sons. God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked. The God who has fed me all my life long to this day. The angel who has redeemed me from all evil. Bless the lads. Let my name be named upon them. Now, they're the sons of Joseph, but in this adoption, they're becoming Jacob's sons, like Reuben and Simeon, his two oldest sons. They're going to have equal footing with them. And the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. So Generations Church, we serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, and Ephraim, and Manasseh. <laughs> Let my name be named upon them. In his blessing in verse 20, he said, By you Israel shall bless, saying, May God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And to this day, those Jews who practice Judaism, every Shabbat includes a time of blessing the children. And in their blessing they will say, May the Lord make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. I don't know that Jacob knew that that would become a weekly thing, but these boys were highly honored, weren't they? Now, they got the birthright. Judah got the blessing. You'll see next week. He definitely, Judah received the blessing. Remember, Jacob cheated his way into the birthright and the blessing. So Judah got the blessing, but Joseph got the birthright. Uh, in dying, a father would pass on equal parts of his wealth to his sons with the exclusion of the eldest getting the double part. So if you had three sons, your wealth would be, would, would be divided into four parts, and each son would get a fourth, but the eldest would get two-fourths or half. So in Joseph's case, there's 12 sons, so Jacob's wealth should be divided into 13 parts, right? And Joseph should get two parts. Well, it didn't happen exactly like that. It was divided into 13 parts, and instead of Joseph getting two parts, he had plenty, right? Richest man in the world, just under Pharaoh. His sons got equal parts with their uncles, I feel like there may be some people here that this kind of triggers you. Maybe you had a parent die and uh, left things to you and you got ripped off in the process. It was unjust. Listen, God is our source. God is our blessing. Do not let that stuff make you bitter. If you become bitter, you're done. Your blessings are, are not going to be enjoyed. You might, you might win in court but you're going to lose in the long run because of bitterness. There are people that have had their wealth restored to them that was stolen, and they were not, a, uh, not able to enjoy it because of what was done to them. I'm not saying it's right. I'm saying he's right. And he's able to make all things work out together for good to those that are called according to his purpose. They'll make you more like Jesus. All right, so that's not my topic today. Today, I want to talk about the importance of blessing our children. As Gentiles, it's customary in many homes on Friday nights for the parents to get drunk and curse their children instead of blessing them. Saul one time got so mad at his son Jonathan, he called him the son of a rebellious woman. The, the New Living Translation gets carried away. I think he takes it too far. He calls Jonathan, you stupid son of a whore. Now, that's very insulting, right? 
But in that culture, to speak ill of your mother, oh no. Oh no. You don't do that in Africa. No, no, no. Do not speak ill of your mother. But that was Saul wanting to hurt Jonathan so much so he criticized his own wife. That stuff is far too frequent in our culture and the blessing of the next generation is far too rare. We have kids confused as to who they are because of identity issues and the world is confusing them And I say we are called as God's people to affirm the next generation, to speak to their strengths and to their weaknesses. I I know we must correct them when they're wrong. I mean, I raise my kids apologizing to them for overcorrecting them all the time. But we must affirm their strengths. The vet was much, much better at this than me when we raise the kids. Although my son tells me I was right most of the time. So may this story be not just a story of the redemption plan, because what's happening is this nation is going to bring forth the seed, the Messiah of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. Who's glad about that? But in keeping this nation intact and together so that this happens in history, centuries later, blessing children became part of it. Started with God visiting Abraham. Abram at the time. Israel saw Joseph's sons and said, who are these? Joseph said to his father, they are my sons whom God has given me in this place. And he said, bring them to me and I will bless them. May our children be blessed more than just during a baby dedication ceremony. More than just when they accomplish something great like graduating from high school or college or becoming a believer in Jesus and being water baptized. But may they know that they're loved and that they have a destiny to fulfill in the kingdom of God because we're affirming them. And may we be an affirming church where we affirm and encourage one another. Who has heard of a man named Kerry Kirkwood? He wrote a book called The Power of Blessing a few years ago. He came here and preached a sermon on that. Uh, A couple weeks ago, Yvette was honored to go speak to the ladies of that congregation and minister. The Lord gave her different plans to pray for folks. If you want to be a bolder witness on your job, come on up and we'll pray for you. Things like that. And she said almost every person she prayed for was appreciative and then said, can I pray for you? And I thought, that's awesome. So church, when you receive prayer, whether it's today or some other Sunday, when they're done praying for you, obviously you want to say thank you. But it's not over till you ask them, hey, can I pray for you about something? Gary Smalley wrote a book called The Blessing with a man named John Trent. And they, in this book is a statement that identifies five things people need to receive from their parents. If your parents are already dead and gone, it's fine. But these are five things people need to receive. A family blessing begins with meaningful touching. There is a doctrine of the laying on of hands, according to Hebrews 6. Meaningful touching, it continues with a spoken message, not just any message, a message of high value that pictures a special future for the individual being blessed. Now, you're not just making things up, but by faith, you are challenging them to go for their calling, which is based on an act of commitment to see the blessing come to fulfillment. All right, so we're going to look at these five things. A blessing should include meaningful touch. So in our story today, Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, who was a younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, guiding his hands knowingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. What is that? That is meaningful touch. If 
you want to know why the right hand was significant to people living in the Middle East, come to me afterwards and I'll explain it to you. Jesus was brought in Mark 10, little children to him. This happened in a couple of the other gospels, that he might touch them. Can we say meaningful? And he took them up in his arms, laid hands on them, and blessed them. Many times in Gentile homes, Friday nights, mom and dad get high and they smack their kids around, abuse them. That's not meaningful touch. Number two, blessings need to incorporate spoken words, not just a hug. That's a meaningful touch. But you got to say something. Maybe not much was said to you that was affirming as a kid to you. So it's, it comes hard to you, but you can work on it. Think about it. Pray about it. Write it out in advance. <laughs> Speak some words. He is blessing Joseph and speaking with his mouth. When they came in, Jacob blessed Joseph and said. Jesus opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are, and he delivered the Beatitudes. Spoken words. Can we say words? Words. Number three, a blessing's words, if it's going to be a blessing, should convey high value. Now, you're not telling your, your kid they're going to be president. You know, if a million parents did that to a million kids, somebody's lying. <laughs> but you're speaking to their God given potential, you're speaking to their abilities. It could be their talent or their passion, something that can be used for redemptive purposes. He said this to those boys, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. Let my name be named upon them and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Let them be patriarchs. Let them have big families. Let their descendants be fruitful people. You're speaking to more than one generation. Maybe the Lord has given you a promise and it's being fulfilled in the lives of your children. It's the same promise because God is the God of the generations. So take comfort in the fact he's using your children mightily. In verse 19, he says, he also, speaking of Manasseh, this is part of Manasseh's blessing, he also shall be great, but truly his younger brother, Ephraim's blessing, shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. So he's conveying high value to their generations, things they wouldn't see with their natural eye till judgment day, just how blessed they were. Tell someone there's more to you than meets the eye. I think in, in our land, we do not think generationally in our culture. We're hyper-individuals. God relates to us as individuals, but he also relates to us corporately. He loves a person you can't stand just as much as he loves you. But he thinks beyond 2021. He's not trapped in time or space. So if you're blessed, you're blessed, whether you're seeing it today or not. It's not hard, just stretch your imagination a little bit. Don't make something up, but this is a biblical principle. Watch this. This is Jesus speaking blessing. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. 
Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. speaking blessings to kinds of people in different states of life with different needs and different strengths. He does this before he drops the hammer and begins to give around 70 plus commands. (laughs) Starts with a position of blessing and then got to love your enemies. Do good to those that hurt you. Such blessings help picture a special future. If it's a peacemaker, I'm a child of God, then no matter what life throws at me, the story ain't over. I have a future, and I have a hope. We used to sing, I have hope when trouble comes my way. I have hope, yes I do, since Jesus has come to stay. I have hope, oh yes, When things are not well with me, I have hope. It's a beautiful hope that sets me free. How can I have hope? Because we have a future. Amen. This shall come to pass. He blessed the boys that day and said, By you Israel will bless, saying, May God make you as Ephraim and Manasseh. They were adopted by their grandfather. Their father was blessed, but their grandfather was one of the patriarchs. They were put on equal footing with their uncles. What a blessing. Here's a continuation of the Beatitudes. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven. I think many times we live too much in the now. We're so earthly minded, we get shut down spiritually and emotionally as we're just living now, just focusing on the injustice, the disappointment, the economy crashed and all your stocks went to pot. Who knows what all happened? Not belittling pain, but I'm helping us to be reminded there's more to us than meets the eye. There's more to my life than is in the lifespan of my physical body. He who believes in me shall never die. We don't die, we just change residences. It's bye-bye body, hello Jesus. Whether you believe we're sleeping in Jesus or you're awake with Jesus, it's bye-bye body, hello Jesus. Amen? Blessings are based on active commitment. If you're going to bless a child, you've got to be committed to help them move forward. It's not just words. And look at what Jacob did. Israel, his name's used interchangeably. Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I am dying, but God will be with you and bring you back to the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to you one portion above your brothers, which I took from the hand of the Amorites. Now it's debated as to what this means. We do know at Shechem, he bought some land. And we do know that's where Joseph was buried. So he may have been speaking to that. 
But he said, I took from the hand of the Amorites with my sword and my arrow. So maybe it got stolen and he had to regain it with some military action. We're not sure. The point is, this was a special blessing given to Joseph. Why? He wanted his bones to go back with him. He's a patriarch's son to the promised land. And it happened when Joseph was dying. He gave instructions to carry his bones back. And so in Exodus, when they made that long trek to the promised land, they're hauling Joseph's carcass with them. In balm, probably like an Egyptian. <laughs> but no doubt coffined. Jesus is committed to seeing us fulfill his blessings upon us. Who believes that? After living the life he lived and dying the death he died and arising from the dead, he proved himself alive for 40 days. Then he ascended into heaven. And prior to his ascension, he said, I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. He's sending the Holy Spirit to help us. The Holy Spirit's the paraclete, the para, the one alongside, to help. Parakletos, the one who's beside us. A para is something beside something. A parachute is something beside you to help. A parasite's beside you, but not so much to help. <laughs> so the Holy Spirit is our comforter to help us. Here's another dramatic presentation from the LUMO project of this statement in its context. I am going to send you what my father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. That's how Luke ends his biography of Jesus. He promises to send them the Holy Spirit that he'd spoken of to them before. He raises his hand and he begins speaking blessings over them. And while he's blessing them, this is the last thing he's doing. While he's blessing them, he's going up till he's out of sight. Speaking blessings over them all the way. You reckon this is an important practice? The last earthly thing he did in his resurrected body was blessing. Then he sent the Holy Spirit. In the book of John, in his promising the Holy Spirit, in the midst of that promise, he says, I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. Or I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. So he is with us through the Holy Spirit. Why? Well, he loves us. We're two or three are gathering in his name. He's in our midst through the Holy Spirit but also to help bring to pass those blessings through gifts, through fruits, through drawing people to the Father. Every person in this room that has a relationship with the Lord was drawn to God by His Holy Spirit. Someone may be witness to you, but what gave you the ears to listen? What watered the seed that was being planted in your heart? The Holy Spirit. 
and the holy people, as imperfect as we are, being used by God. So the power of blessing children is they will have children that they can bless. They will have children that they can bless. It, that the generations to come until the Lord returns, the purposes of God will be fulfilled through people that are blessed to do His will. I'm repeating myself, so I'm going to draw it to a close. What in the world does this have to do with Happy Reformation Day? Well, the Reformation started something. God began restoring truth to His church. And if the blessing of one another or the blessing of the next generation is not part of your culture or our culture, we need some reformation in that area. We need to change. Somebody say, that nails it. (laughs) Happy Reformation Day. How do we do this? Well, Hebrews 11 talks about this day in Genesis 47. It says, by faith, Jacob blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshiped as he leaned on the top of his staff. Romans 12, in talking about spiritual gifts, if you read it all in context, the gifts are to operate in proportion to our faith. In proportion to your faith, we give. In proportion to our faith, we administrate. In proportion to our faith, we serve. In proportion to our faith, we bless. In proportion to our faith, we prophesy. What is prophesying? Is it palm reading? No. Is it predicting the future? No. It is exhorting, edifying, and comforting. The Beatitudes Jesus gave, if you take them to heart, you'll be exhorted. To be exhorted is to be called up to a higher level of living. You'll be edified. You'll be built up to be strengthened. And you'll be comforted. You'll be calmed down where you're all shook up. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that every person in this room would take this word to heart and that when they're with their kinfolks this Thanksgiving or any other time, Lord, they would not miss opportunities to bless. In those families that are able to, Lord, may they make it part of their culture, if not, to at some part of the day, of the week, of the meal, of the month, to lay hand on each person and speak a blessing, a prayer by faith for you to help the person fulfill God's will in their life. In Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, that we're saved by grace through faith, that your word alone is what saves us. But Lord, we thank you that we're saved for good works. And so, Lord, I pray that this good work, this work of blessing would be part of the culture of every person in this room today. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to know this is not part of the the self-esteem movement, you know. This is part of the Bible practice. Speak blessing. Paul wrote two letters to Timothy. He's exhorting him. He's edifying him. He's comforting him. May the Lord help us to be faithful to do that.
in blessing Ephraim and, and Manasseh, the Bible says he, Jacob put his name on them. In number six, the Lord gave Moses a blessing for the priests and said, when they pronounce this blessing, God said, they are putting my name on my people. Now, I believe this blessing has already been fulfilled in Christ and his name has already been put on us. But who knows, it's good to be reminded. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Be blessed. Go get him, tigers. Your name is like honey on my